So I welcome you to the last talk. It's, <laughs> yeah, no, not over yet. We will have one more interesting talk. You will maybe hear Bidel once again too, because Bidel is the one working together with Keith on this interesting project. Keith is also a Debian project member since probably several years, I don't know. He's probably more known not for his rocket work, but for his work on XX drivers. Yeah, so please go on. Thank you. Well, we spent a lot of time this week talking about the delights of building the Debian distribution and packaging software and creating compilers and shipping software, free software all over the world to anybody who wants to use it. Um, this hour is a little diversion. I'm going to spend the entire hour talking about using free software to uh, uh, pursue one of my favorite activities, flying rockets. I'm going to tell you about some uh, software that's in the archive that lets us do this fun hobby, uh, show you some pictures, and uh, maybe encourage you to uh, go out and build something yourself with Debian free software. Amateur rocketry um, has been around since the, uh, after, after the Great War. Um, in the U.S., there was a, there was a, a large number of uh, children who used to fly little tiny model rockets. I know the, the hobby has been popular in Europe for, as, for nearly as long. Um, we like to separate amateur rocketry and hobby rocketry. Um, not really to, uh, we don't really like to separate them, but I'm trying to talk about a hobby which is a little bigger than little model rockets that we fly at the park. Um, it's kind of hobby rockets on steroids. Um, the rockets are generally made of composite construction, so carbon fiber, fiberglass, uh, oftentimes uh, hand machined aluminum. Um, almost all of them fly with electronics in them, so we have computers flying on board the rockets, we have computers down on the, uh, down on the ground analyzing the flight data, designing the rockets. Um, oftentimes we make our own motors, uh, so the motors are made of a, uh, um, a composite uh, propellant to, with ammonium perchlorate and hydrogenated polybutadiene. Uh, that mix together and provide about as much thrust as you can get from a nice, stable, uh, nice, stable uh, uh, tamper, uh, impact resistant fuel. It's the same fuel that powers the solid boosters on uh, NASA's rockets like the Space Shuttle or, uh, or the uh, strap-on boosters on the Ariane Spas uh, flight, um, rockets as well. Uh, amateur rocket tree uh, involves building rockets that go pretty fast, uh, sometimes in excess of three times the speed of sound. Um, our rockets go fairly high, up to about 30 kilometers in the last year or so, and people are striving to get even higher. This, uh, we have one place in the world where we have the ability to fly up to about 60 kilometers, and I'm sure people are designing rockets right now to get that high. Um, and the rockets are often quite large. Uh, this rocket, uh, you can see from the previous frame, if I can do this correctly, um, is about, uh, about a little over two meters long. Um, it's about um, 15 centimeters in diameter and it weighed, when it took off, about 20 kilograms. Uh, but people build larger rockets uh, in excess of uh, one or 200 kilograms. Uh, sometimes they're put up with cranes. Um, they get big. Um, as you might imagine, it's a lot more complicated to build a giant little rocket. Uh, so we, we like to do a little aerodynamic analysis. Uh, in Debian, there's a package called Open Rocket. You can install it uh, from the archive today. It's a rocket design and analysis system written by a master's uh, student uh, from Finland, the uh, name of uh, Sampo Niskanen. Uh, he built a little Java program that let him design rockets. It's got uh, the fluid dynamics necessary to, uh, to uh, compute uh, the drag on the airframe and the uh, effects of Mach speed uh, air flowing over the fins and the nose cone. Um, why does it say about six active contributors? I don't know. Oh, right, yeah. BDL actually told me there's about six people who are actively working on this project. Um, it's a giant piece of Java code, um, and like many Java packages in the archive, it arrives as a steaming pile of jar files that contain a bunch of upstream stuff, a bunch of stuff from other uh, projects, all mashed together in this giant pile. Uh, putting Java code into sensible shape for the Debian, uh, Debian project is kind of a pain. Um, and uh, uh, Open Rocket is no exception. It were uh, one or two releases back at this point, and uh, it, it, uh, it's one of those projects that could use a little help uh, making it clean, making it in the Debian world. Um, another program that we use to design the rockets and build the rockets is called Open SCAD. Um, this is a really fun uh, script-based uh, 3D modeling tool. 
it's not a, you don't draw your object, you, you write code down to generate your objects, and I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, uh, BDL and his son have a lot of uh, CNC machines um, in, their, in their former home, and in their new home they're getting more CNC machines. Um, and they're using this to generate the G-code, which is necessary to, uh, to carve out your, ro your rocket parts automatically. And if you can uh, have a computer controlling your milling machine router to generate your rocket parts, you can generate a lot more precise rocket parts, a lot more reproducible rocket parts, and a lot more rocket parts. Um, <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. And I'll sh I, I, there's a, another slide here. It shows you why we need so many rocket parts. <laughs> Um, and, the, and the final program I wanted to talk about in this section of the, of the talk was a, a, pro, a program called MotorSim. Uh, when we talk about building our own motors, that's actually designing the, the geometry of the, of the propellant and the nozzles and the, and the hardware themselves in order to generate the thrust probe that you're interested in to generate to make the rocket fly the way you want it to. Um, there's actually a, a nice open source program called MotorSim that lets you type in the parameters of your motor and it will tell you how much thrust it will generate. It actually computes uh, an a estimated motor thrust curve, which is uh, thrust over time. Uh, we talked to the author of this code when we found it on the internet and said, you know, we'd really like to be able to package this for Debian. Could you put a license on it that would let us do that? And he said, sure, what license should I pick? And of course, <laughs> what license does one free software advocate always choose? So agreed to GPL the code, and you know, eventually BDL and I will get around to, uh, to releasing that and getting it into the archive. Uh, it's another Java program. Yeah, it's another Java program. There's, there's a theme. Um, it, it seems that most people writing free software for the desktop that aren't dedicated developers in other communities are using Java for their development. And I support that. Uh, I write Java code myself. It's definitely my favorite desktop um, application development environment, although I don't really like Java the language. Um, here's an example of OpenRocket. Uh, you can see up here, we can, where's my cursor? Here it is. You can see up here, you can add little components to your rocket, and you've got a little hierarchical structure of the rocket, and then you've got a picture of the rocket, and it tells you where the center of gravity is by estimating the mass of all the components and the distance from the center of gravity. It tells you where the center of pressure is, which tells you how much uh, air uh, resistance is here and how much drag is up here, and it uh, estimates where the center of those are. And as long as your center of gravity is forward of your center of pressure, then the rocket will go straight. And so it's a bunch of aerodynamic analysis. Other things it does is it knows the thrust curve for many motors that you can purchase, or you can even put your own thrust curve in, of course. And it will estimate how fast the rocket will go and how high it will go and whether it will come apart, uh, which is always good to know. Oh, by the way, your rocket is going to crash. So with those tools, we can build rockets. Here we have a couple of fine examples. Um, on the left is a, a rocket that I call Candy Cane. It's a striped, red striped rocket. Um, that's seen many in can incarnations. Um, I think that's the second set of fins and the original nose cone um, and the original eBay. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, the is, so you have a rocket and you replace the fins and you replace the nose cone and you replace the electronics and you replace the motor. Is it the same rocket or not? I've replaced pretty much every, I have replaced every part of that rocket. Here's a rocket that BDL flew. Um, last, it would have been last spring at an event in uh, Colorado. Where's my, where's my cursor? There it is. Um, called an AMRAM. It's a, a model of an American, uh, American military missile. He had a lot of fun building that. Uh, unfortunately, we had some adventures, which led us to a learning opportunity. <laughs> So the rocket went up to about, well, it was about four kilometers up or so, and uh, yeah, not so much with the parachutes. Um, and it came... <laughs> it, it came straight down, and this is where, how we found it embedded in the dirt. The rocket is actually, oh, about a foot into the ground on both pieces. Now, this rocket is interesting. It has... Uh, the original uh, surface-to-air missile had the forward fin, the control surfaces that would steer the, uh, steer the missile around. Um, in this particular incarnation, incarnation, it's just a model, and so they're just stuck on. But it turns out because there are fins on the rear part and fins on the front part, they both came down together parallel. Because usually if the front part doesn't have fins, it kind of tumbles around and it would have just landed clunk on the ground and been pretty much okay. 
But with fine fins, it was nicely stable. The center of gravity was forward to the center of pressure. The two pieces came down. And yeah, that we call that a learning opportunity. It turns out that the electronics that we designed were faulty. Um, and uh, yeah. So that's why we need a lot of rocket parts, because this happens a lot. Uh, the other program I wanted to talk about was OpenSCAD. Uh, this is the whole UI of the program. It's really simple. On the left, you see a, a, a program, basically, you're writing in, the, in this SCAD language. Uh, it's fairly C-like. It's pretty easy to understand. And as you modify the program, you hit F5, and it runs the program and generates the image. Uh, I could show you a demo of that. I probably won't have time, but I would like to. Um, and so once you generate this, send it to your CNC device, like your CNC router. This is a CNC router in BDL's new... Uh, Altus Metrum World Headquarters, which is a 8 by 16 garage. I think it's like 3 meters by, three meters by 5 meters. That's the entire, the entire space that we have for the Altus Metrum. But it's a router. Um, it's uh, at this point just, uh, just uh, cutting some test patterns. Um, but we expect to be using this to cut a lot of rocket parts in the coming months. Uh, yeah, OK, in the coming days. Let's be clear. Yeah, next weekend, so uh, we will actually, no, two weeks from today, we'll actually be heading on our way to Kansas uh, in the U.S. to uh, to fly a lot of rockets, and that'll be a, an amazing amount of fun. Yeah. Okay, so the other thing we do most of the time, actually, we spend most of our time building electronics. Um, BDL is an evil person. Um, it was about five years ago that BDL said, you know, instead of buying these rocket electronics and letting other people have all the fun designing them and programming them, we could build our own electronics. I know, I'll design the electronics and you can write the software. Whoopee, I'll write the software. What great fun. So Bedia whipped out uh, his favorite GEDA uh, suite of applications for building electronics. Uh, G-Scheme is the uh, schematic editor and PCB is the PCB layout tool. These are both applications in the repository, of course, of course uh, GPL. Um, uh, G-Scheme draws uh, schematic diagrams like this. So you just kind of plunk down your favorite circuit diagrams and wire them all up. And then you push the button that generates a uh, fake schematic, which puts all the components on top of each other and draws the wires in this big rat's nest, called a rat's nest. Um, and then you run this called PCB that sucks that the, all the images of all your parts in and all the, all the little rat's nest wires and you put the parts where you want them by dragging and dropping them and paint little copper between them and you can create a PC board. This is a PC board for a rocket flight computer. It has a little CPU right here. The CPU is a TI Chipcon CC1111 processor. It's got a little flash part up here to store data about the flight. Uh, the ChipCon part is actually a radio, so over here is a radio matching section and an antenna connector. So we'll actually connect an antenna up to that and it will send telemetry down telling us how the rocket's right. And off the back end here, it's got some FETs and some connectors here to connect up some explosive charges that control the deployment of parachutes. Pretty simple. Uh, this board is, um, what is it, about uh, eight tenths of an inch by an inch and a half, which is like two, two, two centimeters by four centimeters, something like that. It's pretty darn tiny. Um, and then, of course, if, if, if you want to be able to, so I, I wanted to sh take you through the process. So here we've designed a schematic. We built a PC board. And then we get the PC boards made, and we get a little stencil made out of Kepton tape and solder paste onto the, onto the board. And then we very carefully, under the microscope, stick all the parts onto the board by hand. And then we stick them in an electric griddle. Because that's how you make, that's how you do electronics these days, is with kitchen appliances. Uh, so this is actually, so the griddle hit, heats up to about 210 degrees, um, uh, reflows the solder, and you take the, and then you turn the griddle off and take the, the board out, and it's all ready to go after it cools off. And then, of course, somebody gets to program it. Here's an example of a finished board. This is an earlier, uh, earlier flight computer, and here's our little... Uh, Okay, I'm going to go nuts with this cursor. A little, there's, there's a little processor again with the radio matching circuit, and there's a, a wire attached as an antenna, and here's the FET that's doing the uh, e ejection charges. Here's another board. We spent a lot of time making boards. Oh, come on. The fastest display tool on the planet. This one, this one has that same little ChipCon part, and this, this one actually has Bluetooth on it, so that's actually a, a commercial Bluetooth module. 
with these little castellated connectors on the side. And so again, you just make a little footprint, stick a little solder on there, clunk it down, and cook it, on the, cook it in the skillet. Uh, because we have our own tools, and because buying circuit boards turns out to be, re- turns out to be really cheap, and because you do them in, in, in the privacy of your very own home, even people like me can slowly learn how to make hardware by incrementally doing multiple. So this design has nine parts on it, and it took me four revisions of the PC board to get it to work. I'm a little slow. But each of these boards cost me a dollar. So it cost me literally like, you know, 30 bucks to do four revisions of the circuit board, including all the components. Um, so I could actually learn electronics in my home without spending a fortune. It's awesome. Uh, these are U.S. dimes. This, this board weighs uh, 1.9 grams or so. I have some examples up here. Oh, of course, with the battery. You have to have a power supply. And the ginormous LED, which is, uh, I think, uh, four millimeters or so across. It's huge. Um, So now that we've built all these electronics, what do we need to do? Ha ha, we need to write the embedded software. I thought this was going to be fun. And for the first couple of years, it was amazingly fun. And then it just got to be tedious. (laughs) Not so tedious that I'm going to stop, but less fun than building hardware, unfortunately. So you can build, apparently you can build an infinite amount of hardware because, you know, it just takes a couple of nights of laying out circuit boards and then ordering them. Then you wait for three weeks thinking about all the mistakes you've made in your PC board. And then the boards arrive and you put them together. They don't work. You rewire them and then you write software. Um, So in the uh, the Debian archive right now, there are two great embedded software development environments. Uh, There's SDCC, the um, uh, embedded uh, compiler for 8-bit micros, but not the Atmel processors. So for the venerable Z80, the 8051, a bunch of PICs, kinds of other nasty 8-bit microcontrollers. How many of you have programmed our delightful friends, the 8-bit microcontrollers? Yeah. Anybody remember the 8051 and how, and how, how much fun that processor is? Yeah, not my favorite either. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, and, the, and the final one here is uh, I've spent the week actually begging people to tell me how to get a uh, a GCC compiler for modern 32-bit embedded processors into the archive for the little ARM Cortex M0, M3 parts. Um, I don't know how to do that yet. Um, Today I spent two hours to to a listening boss trying to figure out how to do this. And it's either really hard, really simple, or really hard. I don't know which yet. (laughs) Yeah. So someday I'll figure this out, or maybe I'll get somebody else to figure it out. I would love to know what the right answer is. There are other people using the Cortex, uh, Cortex parts. They're really cheap, and they're really powerful. So a typical, let me give you a scale of prices here. Um, a typical 8-bit microcontroller is about 2 bucks, uh, 1 to 2 bucks, um, 1 to 2 euros, a couple of Swiss francs. It's, we're pretty, com- pretty ex- uh, the exchange flat these days. Um, the, ARM co- the ARM processor that we're using on our fancy flight computer is $4.00. And the ARM processor that we're using in our smaller one is $1.48, so $1.48. Not a lot of money. This is for a computer m- way more powerful than flew all of Apollo. Yeah. Now they cost $1.48, and you put, them on your, you put them in your toaster. So the, uh, the first compiler we played was with was the small devices C compiler. Uh, the debugger uh, only the debugger that came with it, it came with a compiler library and a full source level debugger, and it's totally separate from GCC. It's like a, it's like a, a one or two person, two or fourths of embedded development. Um, it works with the most ugly of CPUs. It works with the CPUs that GCC refuses to touch. So ones that are so ugly and, or, and not orthogonal and incompatible with C that nobody would even consider using them for C development. But the only other alternative is to write code in assembly, which is a lot worse. Um, so it's, it's, it's in, of course, it's in the Debian archive. Um, the debugger that came with it only worked with the 8051 emulator. So here you are writing 8051 microcontroller code, and the debugger that you have only lets you debug the parts that don't talk about the hardware, because it's all in running in this uh, 8051 emulator. But fortunately, that debugger talked to the 8051 emulator over a little pipe, and so I just created an 8051 emulator that talked directly to my hardware. So I now I had a debugger talking to the 8051 emulator that was actually running 8051 code on my 8051 microcontroller. So now I had a full source level debugger running on my source code 
for my 8-bit microcontroller. This may be one of the few 8-bit microcontrollers with a plausible debugging environment. I, and all because I had the source code to this stuff and I could hack it up and make it do what I needed to do. Uh, I wanted to talk about the GCC for the Cortex parts. Uh, these are little ARM processors, but they're not the ARM processors that you're probably familiar with. They're really tiny. Uh, these parts have, you know, they're in packages that are five millimeters square to 10 millimeters square. So they're really tiny little packages. They don't have very many pins. They have very little memory. Uh, the, uh, the big part that we're using has 128 kilobytes. Kilobytes, not bytes, kill flash memory. Uh, we use the smaller, the smaller ones that we're using has only 32 kilobytes. Uh, they, we don't, they, they don't have a native operating system, so we had to write our own. Um, uh, Lenaro is actually releasing tarballs for this particular target. They work great, um, but that's a steaming pile of source code, most of which we already have in the Debian archive. Um, I don't know how we're going to integrate them into Debian. Uh, here's a couple of suggestions. Um, so when you built your hardware and you got your software programmed, you put them in your rocket. And of course, you don't put just one circuit board or one computer. You put a couple connecting connectors. And yeah. this is from a project that Bdale did last year uh, called y Yik Stick 3. And the goal there was to actually do temperature measurements of the airframe in flight. So the, the board on the, on the left here actually has uh, 13 thermistors, 12 or 13 thermistors connected to it that are scattered throughout one of the fins in the rocket to measure the, the profile of temperatures in the fin in flight. And the board on the, on the right is actually uh, talking over the radio, transmitting that information down to the ground while also storing it in flash. Uh, we had to take the parts off the tops because there wasn't enough space for them. Uh, so those two little parts sitting down there, the GPS antenna and the beeper, uh, those didn't fit because there was only about a centimeter or less of space between, the, yeah, much less than a centimeter of space. So we had to actually take the board apart to get it to fit. Six and a half millimeters, okay. Um, we've, we started this plan of ours to build, uh, to build hardware for us to fly in our own rockets. And we would start taking these fun flight computers off to rock. People would say, that's really cool. Can we get one? And it's like, well, no, I'm making them in a skillet in my kitchen. I'm not going to make one for you, too, because I'd have to make one for everybody. I don't know how to do that. It takes like an hour to make each board. Um, I'm in, uh, at another free software conference in, uh, Austri in New Zealand, in uh, Wellington, New Zealand, we sat down and said, we've got a lot of people wanting this software and this hardware. What should we do about that? And we decided, I know, we'll go into business together because business is an awesome plan, especially yeah, a small independent hardware business. Our simple, don't lose too much money. <laughs> well, the, there is a saying in the rocketry world, do you know how you make a million dollars in a rocketry business? Start with two million, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, but of course, in the, in the rocketry community, very few rocketeers, the rocketeers are split into two camps. There's the redneck rocketeers and the geek rocketeers. You can tell them apart at rocket launches. We all look the same. But the redneck rocketeers, when their rocket is destroyed, they're interested in getting the motor case back. Sooner. When the geek's rocket is destroyed, he doesn't care about the motor case very much. It's kind of nice. But the geek wants the data back. It's kind of an interesting, everybody has a good time blowing stuff up, making loud noises. Rednecks want the parts back. The geeks don't care about the airframe. They just want the data. So we built a system that would give us the data back even if the rocket blew up. That was our telemetry system. Uh, some, of our, some of our fellow rocketeers, they don't run Debian. <laughs> At least not yet. We've actually converted three or four of our friendly rocketeers from running Windows. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> So it's nice to know that even rednecks can be trained. <laughs> but not all of them run Debian yet, so we need a solution for people that are running Windows, that are running Macintoshes, or that have Android devices. Uh, fortunately, Debian provides solutions for those too. Isn't that awesome? So if you want to build software for Windows, you don't need a Windows box. You can build Windows software on your Debian machine. You can write the code, you can compile the code, you can create a package, you can do a whole installation script that puts up the licenses and have all the clicky little boxes to say what parts you want. 
Um, you can put together a UI on Windows if you want to, although I just wrote Java code because I didn't want to write Windows UI code. Ugh. So the, G, uh, the GCC Ming GW uh, compiler lets you build Windows code, native Windows code on your Debian system. And then there's the NSYS installer system that lets you build a, uh, a Windows native installer uh, to, to package up all your software for Windows. On the Macintosh, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we aren't able to compile Macintosh binaries yet, although I don't really know why I couldn't, uh, couldn't construct a GCC backend to do that. Um, but at least I can construct a package for the Macintosh. So because I'm using Java for Macintosh UI, I can build that and test it on Linux. And then I can use the Gen ISO image program in the Debian archive to construct a CD image that the Macintosh will recognize and load, uh, load the application from. It's a nice packaging trick for the Macintosh. And of course, the Android's native development environment is desktop Linux, so we can get all the uh, Android development tools you could ever want. Uh, so we can build uh, software on Debian for Windows, Macintosh, Linux, of course, and Android. So I never have to open up a Windows box to do this work. I never have to open up a Macintosh, uh, except when I need to build some Macintosh-specific C code, and I never have to deal with the uh, Eclipse disaster on Windows either. It's very nice. Here's our little, here's our little Android application. It's a native Android application built on Debian. It uses the uh, common code. So because my desktop application is written in Java and my Android application is written in Java, I can actually share the library code between the two. So I actually have a shared library, a shared jar file that contains all of the complicated computations in the, in the desktop stuff to convert uh, sensor measurements into real numbers and, and uh, compute GPS distances and that kind of stuff. And I actually build it uh, shipped on both Android and, and Linux. So if you're interested in doing applications that port from Windows, Macintosh, Linux, all the way to Android, uh, Java is a pretty nice application uh, development environment. Of course, this application is available in, in uh, the Google Play Store, um, or you could just download the source code from our machines and build it yourself. Well, we decided to start a small business, and every small business needs a whole bunch of software to run their business these days. Uh, the two things that we're doing at Debian right now for our business are accounting to actually run our books and to build a web store. Uh, if, you're building, if you're building physical objects, you need them. It's not like software. You can't just give the hardware away as much as we, as much as we would like to. Uh, so we're selling the stuff through a web store. For accounting, we, tried, we started out with GNU Cache, and in fact, our books are currently in GNU, GNU Cache. It's a pretty nice uh, entry to, uh, introduction to double-entry bookkeeping. Um, it mystified me for a long time, I have to admit. Uh, BDL told me a couple of uh, pretty simple pointers that led me to kind of figure it out, although I still have adventures and have to relearn half of it every time I open up the UI. Um, it's certainly a lot, of, uh, certainly a straightforward, as straightforward as double entry bookkeeping can ever be, apparently. Um, the problem is that it's very GUI based. Um, the data files are big binary blobs. And we like to have traceable entries that we can track our, our cash transactions and our bookkeeping in a nice ASCII text format so that when you commit them in Git, because everything lives in Git, uh, you can actually see differences that make sense. So we're switching over to this command line uh, accounting program called Ledger CLI uh, that, that uses a file that you edit with a text editor and then you, you basically compile the text file into a set of books uh, for your business. On the web store front, I don't think either of these is available in Debian. Um, it would be low. Yeah, exactly. So these are PH a couple of PHP disasters that we run on the standard. Yeah, oh my god. Who likes PHP? Whoever thought this was a good idea? In any case, uh, we started out building our store with a, a system called OpenCart. It was fairly easy to use, and it had constructed store, so all you had to do is dump your parts into it, um, and, or dump your, your products into it, and you could see them immediately. Um, it was easy to get stuff up and running. It had kind of a primitive uh, Google Checkout integration. Um, the problem is the, it, and it works. We're currently using this. Uh, we, uh, we were using this until a couple of months ago, uh, and then the server had a problem. Um, the problem with OpenCart was that getting an order out of the system and getting the shipping label printed and getting the order processed through Google Checkout took a lot of clicking uh, and a lot of interaction by, by us, and we didn't really like that. And the store itself was really hard to make it work the way we wanted to. So we're switching over to a more complicated system that's actually used by a, a, um, a fair number of major retailers, 
online retailers, uh, called Magento, which is huge and amazingly configurable. And when it comes up, you have an empty web page. And it's like, uh, now what do I do? You start typing a bunch of PHP code, apparently, to get your products into the web page. Um, it's very configurable, and it's enormous and difficult to understand. But the payoffs here are that the payment and shipping stuff is way better integrated. So when the customer uh, uh, clicks through to find out how much shipping costs, it actually has a shipping computer that goes and talks to UPS or FedEx or the post office and figures out how much it's going to cost to ship it to them. And the order handling is nicely automated so that when the payment happens, it, it way fewer manual steps. It's going to be nice. Uh, neither of these is packaged for Debian, so this would be an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, what's it about four years ago we were in New York? DevConf 10. DevConf 10. And this is DevConf 14, 15? 13. 13, whatever. In New York. <laughs> so many DevCons. So After DevConf in New York City, uh, BDL and I actually arranged an expedition uh, about uh, 150 miles away from New York City, they were having a rocket launch the weekend after DevConf. So we took a collection of the DevConf attendees up there and introduced them to the fine sport of model rocketry. I know. It's the, uh, and, and we did provide free rockets, didn't we, Bedale? Free motors, free transportation. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> They're bad, bad people. And here's, here's a couple of us enjoying the rocket launch up there. We had a good time. Uh, small rockets. Um, I brought, a, I brought a, a fairly large, it was about a meter long, not a very big rocket. And you had sharp stick, that's right. So we, we had a, an awfully good time. The lovely part about the New York uh, rocket experience was that it was done on a sod farm where they're actually selling, gr um, selling turf to be cut, rolled up, and brought to suburban homes for, to, uh, to put out there. So before the, so before the turf is cut, we actually get to fly rockets on it. So it's like flying on a giant lawn. It's awesome. It's like, oh, my rocket is over there on the grass. Oh, this is going to be very hard to walk to. I don't know if you saw the, when you saw the first slides here, here, go back and I'll show you. This is where I fly rockets out in eastern Oregon. It, the place is covered with sagebrush, which is a uh, hardy, uh, drought-tolerant species uh, with sharp, pokey branches, and it entirely covers the place. It also has uh, a, a species of rabbit that is apparently capable of taking your rocket and hiding it under the sagebush within minutes <laughs> of the flight. I don't know where we grow those rockets. So out in Oregon, if you, this, is, this rocket's like two and a half meters long, 15 centimeters in diameter. If it lands, you have to get to within 20 or 30 feet of it before you can see it. Because the sage bushes, it's about you know, a meter tall, just tall enough to cover everything. It doesn't look like anything when you're looking out over it. It looks you know, like a nice flat, nice flat feature of this terrain. But in fact, it's covered with bushes. Uh, so. Flying that is kind of it. Flying in that environment is kind of an adventure. So flying out in uh, in New York was kind of fun because it was a giant lawn, and we really had a great time with the Debian developers and other other DevConf attendees flying out there. And with that, I think that's the end of my presentation. This is uh, BDL Sun, who uh, real airframe. Um, it has kind of a funny shape. It's got a lot of fins on it and a very round nose. It turns out, in order to make this airframe stable, you have to put like a kilogram of metal in the nose. Otherwise, it's not stable. Almost two kilograms. <laughs> yeah. So that thing is, re it's, it's like a little, you know, it's a flying brick. <laughs> <laughs> which, which gives, ex you know, an extra challenge because it's really heavy. So you have to be very careful about recovery and deployment systems and... Uh, Robert actually flew it successfully for uh, his junior NAR levels, uh, junior, no, his uh, Tripoli, uh, uh, Tripoli research, Tripoli uh, certification so he can fly high power rockets with us um, and had a great old time. You can see he li they also live in a desert. Uh, right next to his knee is a cactus bush. And so when you're walking around that area, if you happen to brush up against one of those big pieces that break off and bite you, yeah, we fly rockets in hostile, hostile territory. In any case, with that, that's my story of Debian software for flying rockets. We have about 10 minutes if you have questions, or we can head out for the barbecue. So thanks, Keith. There's a question. 
I actually have uh, two questions I want to ask you. First question is, uh, is there any risk of uh, you actually hitting an airplane while you're shooting your rocket up? That's a really good question, because these rockets go, as, as, I, sa as I said, they'll go 30 kilometers, which is well past the altitude of most, a most airplanes. We actually work with our local civil aviation authorities to ensure that while we're flying rockets in this area, we have the airspace off out of the aviation maps. And in fact, out in eastern Oregon, when we're flying rockets out there, if an airplane goes near our area, you actually see it come to the edge of our area and go around <laughs> and keep going. <laughs> Yeah, the, we, we work very closely. We also have very stringent rules so that if you see an airplane in the sky and the sky is big because there's nothing there, you don't, you don't, you don't launch the rocket. The rocket is typically uh, ascending for less than a minute. And so an, uh, uh, an uh, uh, airplane at the horizon is going to be 10 or 15 minutes away. So, the, so you're clear for the entire duration of the flight, even if somebody doesn't read uh, notifications uh, to know not to fly airplanes in that area. So we're very careful about airplanes. But... The sky is also really big. Airplanes are really small, and these are unguided rockets. So even if we tried to shoot a rocket at an airplane, the chances of us hitting it are infinitesimally small. So, and of course, most of our rockets, except that one, uh, are, don't have a lot of mass to them, and uh, actually hitting an airplane with them would, be, would, would terrify the pilot, but probably be harmless. Although, I wouldn't want to be in an airplane hit by that chunk of lead. <laughs> Okay, and, uh, yeah, my, my second question is about the, the radio interface you, you have on your rocket, because apparently you, you, you actually want to relay the data back to Earth while the, the rocket is still in the air. Oh, yeah. So which radio standard are you using? So actually, yeah, I didn't talk about anything about we, what we actually built, uh, but the, the products that we built are called Telemetrum, and we use amateur radio uh, frequencies, in this particular case, the 400, uh, 400 megahertz band, and we constructed a custom digital telemetry system that uses 38.4 uh, kilobaud uh, Gaussian-shaped uh, frequency sh uh, FM modulation on a 70-centimeter carrier. Um, and on top of that, we put, um, we put uh, 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 constraint for half-rate uh, convolution encoding of the data. Uh, for, uh, for good error recovery. And so we're just doing a, basically a custom digital modulation of the data at 38 kilobaud, um, which gives us a 19 kilobaud data link. So we're actually able to get a lot of data down while the rocket's in flight. Uh, the radio runs only 10 milliwatts, and yet we're able to get ranges upwards of you know, 30 or 40 quite reliably because of the encoding scheme. Uh, the, the chipcon part that we used there with the horrible 8051 microcontroller in it, we chose that because it had a digital radio part capable of doing this modulation scheme. That was really the genesis of our idea of how to build a small rocket computer that could also send the data down. Now, another important part of that, of the flight computer that we usually use, is it has a GPS receiver in it. So the rocket not only tells you what's going on, it also tells you where it is which is important when it falls in the bushes and, you haven't, and the rabbits hide the, hide the important parts of it. So, it actually, so you actually, uh, so I telephone, I have a, a, an indication of where I am and an indication of where it last heard from the rocket. And when you put those two dots together on the screen, you're usually within sight of the rocket. So it's, it's, it used to be finding your rocket after you launched it was a huge hunt and all, people had you know, great stories about you know, walking for days and days to try to locate their rocket. And unfortunately, we've kind of, uh, kind of removed that section of fun from the, fun from the hobby um, by making it so that you just walk to your rocket when it's on the ground. But that's what the telemetry is for. The telemetry tells you uh, things like what the temperature is within the rocket, uh, how high the rocket is with bare. It tells you whether the battery voltage is OK. It tells you if the ejection charges have fired, all kinds of stuff like that. That's great fun. And we have ex uh, so our usual flight computer has an accelerometer to tell you uh, what the motor is doing to your rocket, a barometric altimeter to tell you how high it is. Our more advanced ones have three axis of gyroscopic information to tell you how tilted the rocket is, um, and three axis of accelerometer to actually be able to compute the, the, the flight path of the rocket. Um, and all that's recorded on, in flash on the rocket flight computer, and a portion of it, the amount that we have bandwidth for, is transmitted over the telemetry stream. Lots of fun. All this stuff is oddly free software under the GPL. Um, the designs are licensed under the Tapper Open Hardware License, which is a GPL-ish license for hardware. And all of those designs and all of the software is available at altusmetrum.org.
Other questions this afternoon? How long before you go to space? That's actually an interesting question. Uh, XKCD had a really, good, uh, uh, a really good comic on this a couple of days ago. I suggest you go look at it. Um, space is, by definition, 100 kilometers up, and we already have people getting to 30 kilometers. So you're thinking, ah, it's only three times as far. How hard can that be? Well, it turns out getting to space is actually very plausible. Probably two stages of a, a fairly, a fairly a well-designed rocket could probably reach 100 kilometers in, in, in height. The big problem with space is staying in space. Our rockets, at, at 30 kilometers, that rocket was going you know, zero kilometers an hour relative to the Earth. So it just went straight up and came straight down. In order to stay in space, you have to be going Mach 15 at 100 kilometers up. So you have to, have a, you have to get enough fuel up to that spot to be able to accelerate yourself to the 15 times the speed of sound before you'll stay in space. So it turns out getting to space is very plausible. Uh, with our technologies, the, the prospects of staying in space without a lot more money and a lot bigger uh, rockets is pretty, is pretty weak. That's a good question. As I say, XKCD had a, pretty good, uh, had a pretty good comic on this a couple of days ago you might go look at. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Other question? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. Um, for those of you who are going to be at DebConf next year, um, there's a, a rocket launch. Well, I don't know which weekend DebConf is going to be scheduled at because the week that it's currently scheduled is one that has a rocket launch conflict for a couple of us. Yeah. But in any case, uh, if you do come to DebConf next year in Oregon, I can promise you that if it's uh, scheduled at a time that I can attend, we can take you out for a big rocket launch in eastern Oregon. Yeah, we have, we have access every weekend to, uh, to the Oregon desert. So if you want to build rockets, maybe rocket buff. We've done that a couple of times. And this is probably the closest we're ever going to get to a home field for either, either BDL or I, because it is my home field. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Um, so what's the average safety radius you need for flying such rockets? I guess it's difficult to find a place um, where you can safely um, fly rockets in densely inhabited areas. Yes, it indeed it is. Uh, uh, so what we, what, the, what we do is we work with the civilian, uh, civilian fire authorities and the civilian aviation authorities to try to find a place that's safe to fly rockets. We have to be far enough from inhabited buildings, so let's land in the building, we don't kill anybody, which means we don't want to land on buildings. We have to be far enough from uh, busy roads so that a rocket lands in the middle of the, so we don't want the rocket to land in the middle of a busy freeway. Um, we have to be, we don't like to fly near trees because if the rocket lands in trees, they're very difficult to get down. Uh, fortunately, in the western U.S., it's a desert and nobody lives there. <laughs> I, it's really hard, when I come to Europe, it's really hard for me, I can easily understand how difficult it is for you to grasp. But I go to a place that I fly rockets where they're within 50 miles. So imagine a place in Europe with a 70, 70 kilometer radius where there are no inhabitants at all. There are no, no, you know, there's no shacks, there's no cows, there's just sagebush. So, and a lot, yeah, the evil rabbits. Test, test, yeah, okay. So it is worth mentioning, though, that um, there's actually a quite active set of high-power and amateur rocketry groups in Europe. There is, in fact, a Tripoli uh, Prefterland, and they have launches approximately once a month somewhere in the country, and their big annual event, apparently, is a four-day weekend in October, um, about 15 kilometers the other side of Neuchâtel. So we're actually quite close to where the big Swiss launch happens every year, but we're just here at the wrong time. So. Yeah. <clears throat> and again, because we designed the rockets to go straight up and come straight back down, the general rule of thumb is if you want to go, up to, you know, if you want to go three kilometers up, you need a space that has one and a half kilometers of radius clear of any buildings. That's not a huge space, right? You can imagine a farm big enough to do that in, and there are apparently farms just a few kilometers away uh, near Neuchâtel where, it's, uh, where you can fly rockets. And of course, the smaller the field, you just build rockets that don't go as high. Um, and that's also fun. Uh, most, of my, most of my rocketry is done within a, within a kilometer or so of the ground. 
and the rockets usually land within a couple of hundred meters of where I launch and, them. And even my launches, most of them are in the two to three kilometer yeah. altitude range. The, you know, the, the really high launches we do in places like the Black Rock Desert in uh, Nevada or uh, the launch that Keith and I like to go at uh, to at the end of August every year is in the middle of wheat fields. And after they harvest the wheat and plow the fields, it's just plowed dirt that's flat as far as you can see in every direction. And they have a waiver to 50,000 feet above ground and 12 nautical miles radius. So it's a really, really big area to fly, really big rockets. Well, I want to thank you for